But I want to touch on the pledge, uh, Waverly Street Foundation, and the deadline to spend the money over the next decade. Can you talk a little bit about, one, what types of work you'll be doing and prioritizing, mm. and then also what are the advantages of like fast giving philanthropy, uh, and are there any risks? Yes, so, um, so a few years ago, we, we stood up what's called the Waverly Street Foundation as a foundation, a spend down fund, and it's exclusively focused on climate giving. Um, so environmental and climate resiliency, uh, mitigation and adaptation. And it's run, it, so it's a, it's a standalone foundation. It's separate from Emerson Collective. It's run by um, a man named Jared Blumenfeld, who was the architect of all the California policies. He actually, all the, the California environmental policies that have passed over the last several years, he was um, the, the lead climate uh, architect with Gavin Newsom. And he also worked at the EPA when Lisa Jackson ran the EPA, so she knew him really well. And he ran the western states for the EPA uh, and tribal nations as well. And so Lisa, who was just here on the stage, is our board chair, and I am the vice chair, and we have a small, tight board, uh, and we are very, very focused on working with communities to, to make sure that we can help support civil society as, as this transition has to happen. So, for example, for, for smaller, under-resourced communities, it's very difficult for them to apply for grants, say IRA grant matching grants or grants through Justice 40. And so there are ways to buttress local governments so that, so that that application process and then that distribution process happens in a much more equitable way. And so, so we're looking deeply at that. But we're, we're looking globally, not just in the US. We'll probably, I think, the foundation will focus both outside, about 50% outside the US and 50% inside the US. The whole purpose of that foundation is to address the, the pressing nature of, of the climate crisis between now and early 2030s, and that's why we, we structured it as a spend down fund. Um, most foundations are not structured to spend down their, their funds over a given period of of time. Uh, we were inspired by the Atlantic Philanthropies, which very famously did that and actually spent down their entire corpus. Uh, I think that there are, there are generational issues that some foundations address, like the Ford Foundation. Uh, I know them a, a little bit because I'm, on the, I'm new to their board, but I'm on their board, and I understand how they feel that, that the passing of the baton happens from generation to generation, and you work for a long time on a problem that needs, in a, in a way like an ocean liner, needs to pivot and turn slowly but surely. Then to me, there, there are problems that need to be addressed sort of like a speedboat, and we're in the middle of, of this window of opportunity that will be closed in a decade. And so that's why we thought, this, there's no need for us to spend 5% a year when the actual issue is right in front of us right now. We need action right now. Yeah. We don't have a lot of and, time. And there, time will, be mistakes, be up, there so. will be mistakes. There will be mistakes. I think that philanthropic capital should often be viewed as at-risk capital because it, we can de-risk ideas and then others can take it to scale, either, either government, state, local, federal governments can take it to scale, or companies can take it to scale. But to get that early capital in, I, I think changes the game. Well, thank you. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you for telling us your story today, coming to New Pleasure. York, and congratulations again. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Jess.